you. All right, welcome. We're so excited you were able to join us today by Mimicry Switzerland with our webinar series. Um, and today we have a special guest. His name is Chris Montero. And Chris is actually um, a friend of mine that we traveled a couple of times together as part of the Biomimicry Professional Certification. So Chris is a naturalist, a traveling naturalist and illustrator, and he studied biology, ecology, and zoology in Costa Rica, and also completed his studies in the Evergreen State College in Washington State. He has worked as a scientific illustrator, animator, storyboard artist, nature guide, trip leader, and educator. He also has published multiple publications. He has created educational materials and worked for organizations such as National Geographic Student Exhibitions and Mass Audubon. Chris currently works as a full-time staff member at Biomimicry 3.8, specializing in professional training and illustration. And as you will see, his skills and illustrations, especially in the nature journaling field, are just mind-blowing. So I hope you guys are ready to be inspired. Chris, I will give the stage to you. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everybody. Uh, very exciting to see definitely some familiar names, people that I, I haven't seen Chris, or heard of. Chris, can't hear you. Oh, you cannot? Sorry. All right. Oh, you can. Uh, I can't. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Do you guys can hear me okay? Yeah, we can All hear right. you okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Good to know. No worries. Um, so, yeah, excited to hear some familiar names. Uh, thank you for making the time and joining us. And again, uh, there's so much to talk about nature journaling that one hour I feel is not enough, but I'll do the best I can at least to share some. Uh, tricks. Um, I know there are different levels of art also in, in every group and any set of participants. Some people are more comfortable sketching, some people are not. But the nature journaling is not necessarily about sketching or doing art. In my particular case is because uh, besides my background in natural sciences, I have uh, a background in illustration. Uh, for the record, I never studied art. Uh, these are things that I picked along the way. Uh, all of the time that I worked as animator, it really helped me to get to know certain tools about art and uh, concepts that have been incredibly helpful. That was my equivalent of going to art school, and I still apply this uh, today. Now, when it comes about a nature journal, uh, I want to also again say is you tailor it in the flavor you want. For me, is finding this balance between data and storytelling and, and learning, but also art. And so this is more or less what you will see reflected in my journals. Everybody can take it in the direction that you want. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. I have some slides. After these slides, uh, I have a, a docu camera. I will show you some. Actually, I have some physical journals here, show them to you up close in the camera. And hopefully we'll do a little uh, sketching exercise to put in practice at least uh, through some of the concepts that I'm going to offer to you later. Again, there's so much to talk about and, and it's hard to keep it general, but at least I'm gonna go with some ideas that can you can have about how to sketch, how to approach, especially animals that are one of the hardest thing to draw for many people. Um, so, and at the end, we will have the opportunity for Q and A. So if you have any questions, please type them on the, the chat and Michelle or Vinilla they will help, uh, help me Yes, to, to funnel the questions to me, uh, to pass them later at the end of the presentation, the last 10 minutes, 15 minutes, depending how we're doing with the timing. All right, so let's get started. Yeah. There we go. Is everybody seeing the PowerPoint okay? Yes. Awesome. Fabulous. All right, it's so... Again, it's an ambitious title. The Nature Genius, genius is something that it's a work in progress. I mean, what uh, I'm going to share has been basically my entire life. I've been sketching and taking notes of different, in different uh, ways and styles. But uh, um, this is a quote that I really liked. And uh, it's about how when we understand and learn more about the natural world, we're capable of seeing more. Back in the day when I was learning English in my native Costa Rica, um, I worked as a tour guide. And it's one of the skills that I learned for the rest of my life, how to spot animals. And people are like, wow, how do you see that? 
that moth or how do you see that bird in the distance is like it requires training our senses so again it's a process uh, when it comes to the journal, it's the same thing. Uh, this is an entry that I was very happy with uh, from last year in Namibia. Um, and later I will explain a little bit more about the different tricks that I use. Uh, some of these drawings are live in the moment when the animal is in front of you, which is very hard to draw animals that are moving. And of course, I finished some details later. Sometimes when I have the time, I can sit down there for 20 long minutes and sketch an animal, but that usually not the case and so nice. again i'll be sharing some tips yes would you mind sharing your slides full screen that way it will be a little bit bigger oh they're us. not full screen there oh, okay that's what they were oh there we go sorry about that oh, that's great thank you thank you i thought it was in full screen all right um so okay I cannot talk about keeping a nature journal without talking a little bit about what it is to be a naturalist and um in, in short, again, it's somebody who cares about the connections and interrelationships of organisms within their context, the natural context. Context is everything for a naturalist. And why I'm saying this, because as we take a step outside of the door to observe birds or plants or, or fungi, we are being naturalists. You don't need a background in science or ecology to be a naturalist. And yes, it helps to have some studies in that field, but it's something that we can take at any point in our lives and uh, personalize it at our own, depending on our own field of interest. Uh, some people are really into plants or microorganisms, so, or other people like me, we have a bias towards wildlife and animals. Now, when it comes to being a naturalist, it's a little bit confusing, uh, like because you have heard about uh, it was a very popular thing in the 1800s, being naturalist. People like Charles Darwin or Alexander von Humboldt, they started their careers, uh, they, they were being naturalists. So the whole point about being a naturalist when you study uh, the natural world out there, more than in a lab. Uh, and it, it's a discipline that requires a lot of observation skills. And this is, again, something that we develop in time. There are even exercises that you can practice, have to be a good observant, uh, uh, and nature. It also requires a lot of patience. And one of the best part of this, you have to slow down and observe around you. Uh, Janine Benius uh, uh, talks all the time about quieting, quieting our cleverness. And I think it's a good way. But also you can combine it if you are more interested in data collection, you can be even more rational. But it always requires to be out there, pay attention, being exposed to the elements sometimes. And again, you take it as much as you want. Uh, being a naturalist could be something that we can do in our yard or a nature park near, near where our homes, or you can travel to exotic places in Africa or Antarctica. But the common ground is, again, being outside. Um, there are scientists, famous scientists that are naturally, Jen Goddard. Um, E.O. Wilson was uh, one of the, the most famous uh, biologists in, in the field of ants, what is called a mycologist. And he described himself as a naturalist because he spent a lot of time studying animals in the field. Like, for instance, in the case of Jane Goddard, all her experience and knowledge with chimpanzees came from a lot, uh, many years of studying these animals in the wild and getting a very intimate connection with their environments. So the context, the natural context, is everything. Uh, now, when it comes about being a naturalist, the most simple tool that you can have is a, piece, uh, is a notebook and a pen. And you can tailor it in many ways from color pencils to uh, watercolors, uh, but there are different ways to uh, work uh, your set of tools for your nature, uh, nature journal. Uh, to me, I define it as just a tool to learn and connect. It helps me to connect with the natural world, but not only the natural world, also with peoples and landscapes when I'm traveling uh, to the land. Now, these are a few examples of nature journals. It can be as simple as a notebook. Some just lose notes about, in this case, elephant sexing and aging. That was learning from a local biologist in, in Botswana once. Uh, and in the upper one, you can see is mixed in English and Spanish. That was the time when I was learning English. So some notes are in English because it was easier for me to remember the terms from books 
and the notes for myself were in Spanish. Could be uh, basically a log of organisms and plants that you're observing. And the advantage of this, uh, de depending again how you take how you approach your nature journal, you can get to know an area really well. That's why we always say it's good to start where the area that you are more familiar with around your house or the, the place where you live. Uh, that's when you notice changes in seasonality. Uh, that's when you notice also like new species that show up and, and things like that. And uh, the lower right shows more or less like the, tri the, the travel journals that I have where I collect stories also and try to combine with plants that I'm learning and landscapes and, and stuff like that. Again, sky is the limit when it comes to the nature uh, journal. Um, now, it has multiple advantages, whether you have a background in sciences or not, it stimulates your brain. And that's one of the things that I like about this tool. I can, I can find different entry points, different doors, if you will. I can sometimes I don't feel like identifying that much. Like I just want to sketch and do art. Uh, sometimes go to the zoo or a natural history museum and, and just some sketching of people even, you know, you take it again and the way you feel it. Sometimes you're waiting for the boss and you just, oh, they have in front of you like people walking on the street. Um, but again, sometimes you can also try to think about creative writing. Uh, in the last few years, all my journals are in English. And the reason for that is because I want to keep practicing, uh, not, uh, not getting lazy, you know, and just keep practicing my grammar and my storytelling too. So it, it has the beauty of this. It keeps stimulating your brain and, uh, because you can choose how to uh, personalize your approach. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this appreciation for nature and the sense of place. Uh, it is a very important thing. I, we speak a lot in the conservation world. It's about getting to know the place where you live, the land that you're connected to. And when you're traveling, the contrast and the newness of new landscapes and uh, ecosystems. And again, you can take a scientific or just a merely artistic aesthetic approach in your observations. And it's fun when you try to combine them because there's a lot to learn from art as an observ in observations and sciences and vice versa, taking a more rational uh, approach when we're trying to understand a subject as an artist. Okay. Um, now, taking some notes from uh, Claire Walker, Leslie, she is famous uh, for her books, Nature Journaling. And if you haven't had the opportunity, I'd be happy to send you some links of the, uh, the names of this, some of these books. Uh, jo John Muir Laws is another famous uh, journaler that have published vast materials, really intensive materials. So you can, again, get a lot of ideas. I took this one for this particular book called Keeping a Nature Journal. And um, again, there are multiple benefits of keeping a nature journal. But again, one of my favorite ones is that it helps to, to, to hone your senses, to increase your perception, you know, to become more uh, creative also. Uh, the layout and presentation of ideas, uh, I do some visual arts and it's fun to try to think about my journal like a magazine. Uh, and now we'll talk a little bit more about that, how to change the layout and be creative and how to express yourself again. Um, technical writing, creative writing, I've been mentioning about that. Sometimes it could be just a, a log. Today, I got up at this time, I saw a walk on this trail, it was three hours, we saw this species of plants, this species of fungi, which is a really good way to, again, get to, to, to train your brain and make references, ask questions, um, make observations, but also simply can be like storytelling. Hey, something really fa funny happened to me today. And when we went to the beach, and this is blah, 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 blah. And it's a good way for yourself to, to capture the stories in ways that cameras and videos will not allow you to. More a very personal way, and that's what it is there, finding your own voice. And if you want to go into the deepest reflective part of nature, journaling is definitely, again, you have to slow down, stop there, observe around. It has a meditative quality. You know, it could be, uh, it could be very helpful to just listen more to observe more to ask questions and the personal healing aspect again journaling is, is a great tool many therapists can tell you that the importance of just keeping notes and help to process things um, now this is normally what i talk about this in the end but this is so important for me that i want to uh pass this in this presentation so i'm going to talk a little bit about tips 
things that I have picked over the years with my own practice. One of my favorite ones in these days is having a little notebook, always in my pocket or in my bag, and uh, use that as a supplement for my journal. Because sometimes uh, you get attached to your journals and they're becoming nicer and you have all these nice drawings and notes over the years, you wanna take care of them. Uh, and sometimes you don't have the time to just pull the entire year. Uh, so just grab a little notebook, do some quick notes. You can transfer them to your final journal. And it's a good, good way also to revisit what happened during the day. This is a good example of this. What you're seeing in the screen, for instance, in the upper right, it's uh, what my actual notebook. Uh, and that's a note from, you can say, February the 11th, 2017. I was in this national park in the lowlands of Costa Rica. And I wrote a list of birds that I get to see that morning. And I took some really good sketches of this type of wrens called bay wrens. And if we have any bird watchers in the room, you know wrens are not cooperative. They're not user friendly. They don't stay around and let you make observations. Well, these family of wrens were very active and very, uh, they, were, they, were, they were very cheeky. They were in the open. So I was even taking sketches you can see in, the, in, in my nature, uh, sorry, in my, in my notebook. And I, I was excited because very few times I had the opportunity to observe these wrens so well. For some reason, they were out and about. I took some sketches and then I transfer at the end of the day on my, my big journal. And you can see, if you pay attention to the sketches uh, of the journal, the bird on the left, is, it fits what is in the upper right um, page. And the other two, I took the same poses and just polished them. I had fo some photographs, I use uh, my own bird guide, and you can even see I transfer the same leaves uh, from the habitat that created this natural feeling when it was still very fresh in our brain. And that's one of the things that happens a lot. It's good to capture uh, ideas or concepts when they're fresh. We say, oh, we, I will never forget this. We start forgetting things. I still look at things uh, or, or events. We are talking, Michelle, earlier like a, uh, early about rhinoceros. And then like, when I thought I remember, I would never forget all the details of that encounter with rhinoceros, uh, uh, Namibia once. I look at my own notes and they're like, oh my God, I forgot this detail. So it's good to have captured this in the moment. Um, as I mentioned about changing the layout for each page, these two pages of my journal is a good example of that. I like to mix it up, make it interesting. And then all the, uh, I know the type of person that likes uniformity. So each page look interesting, it's like a magazine, you know, you have the illustrations, I switch sides, I have columns, I use little call outs. And that's when you can use different types of elements, like I call it fonts, like capitalized letters. Some people have an incredibly beautiful uh, handwriting, so you can play with that element too. Um, and if you are not into drawing, it's, it's okay. You can still collect uh, entrance tickets to the national parks uh, or postcards. And uh, even beer labels, I have used that for uh, my travel, like, oh, the really cool label uh, from a beer, I took it out and, and, and glued it to a journal. Um, so it's up to you how creative you want to see. In a few moments, I'm going to show you some journals, and you can see a, an assortment of different visual elements that I use. Vellum paper is like magic. Uh, it's this tracing paper, basically. And uh, back in the day, I used it a lot. Uh, is you can just go to a, a, a good photography that you have in one of your field guides or something and just trace it and then cut it and glue it into your journal voila you have a good uh, little sketch uh blue pencil we're going to be talking a little about uh, a little bit about that you notice in some of my sketches there's some blue pencil um i'm going to show it in a few moments it's just a way to trace very softly and then i use ink as a final uh, render vignettes that's another one that i enjoy a lot um it's basically creating a mini story and you can do a little cartoon of yourself or a little sketch of yourself in the moment and uh it's a good way to recall stories and it also helps diagrams uh this is we were coming down the hill this is where we saw the bear turning around this this point uh on the trail and there's this big tree with its roots yada yada so you can use these elements and create like a mini map uh think about uh when we going back to what is to be a naturalist all the uh you know, all the ancient cultures of planet Earth, this is a matter of survival, recording events in nature, changes in the seasons, uh, what is fruiting, where the animals are moving. It's innate in our human nature uh, how to connect and record events. 
number your pages is a good practice. Like uh, this is not an example of that, but in other journals, when I like to, I started, uh, for instance, starting a subject, I write some notes and then I revisit it. They're like, oh my God, more, more, more notes about dragonflies in page 94. So you can create a cross-reference and it helps you when you're studying. And again, customize your field gear. Uh, there are different ways to do that. You can eventually learn what you like to carry and what not. Having like a little ruler, for instance, super helpful. Having a sharpener, uh, keeping your pencils in the, the Ziploc bag so they don't stain other materials. All these type of little tricks you're, you're picking along the way. Now, if you're, if you're drawing in a rush and it comes to animals or almost anything, um, I try a gesture sketch in the field and I finish it later. Now, what is a gesture sketch? If you are not accustomed, if you haven't worked in art, I'm gonna to explain to you, it's one of the tools that I would like to share with you, whether you're an advanced artist or not, it's incredibly helpful. A gesture sketch uh, is basically, it's, uh, or gesture drawing is used in art. When you see artists working with new models often, there's a timing and you have a, in the lower right, an example of that. You start warming up your hand with sketches that are 30 seconds. Believe it or not, those sketches are 30 seconds. Once you are in the zone, it's incredible how much information you can capture. Uh, and then the ones on the extreme right is one minute. So you have more time to polish. And as you're increasing the time, when you have 20 minutes, it's like, oh my God, you know, you can do a final piece of art. This is incredibly helpful uh, when it's about capturing ideas fast, when it's about capture movement or behavior. And the important thing to remember about gesture drawing, and this is a reminder to myself, is not about details. And the reason for that is because I do a lot of scientific illustration, I get lost into the details. One of the big problems that uh, I've experienced as an artist is overdrawing, overdoing a piece. And you start adding details and lines and then you're realizing you're ruining it. It happens a lot. And this is an important thing actually I want to share with you because people look at the journals and like, oh my God, this is so good. But yeah, uh, or any artist and you feel in a certain way discouraged. You're like, I'll never be able to do that. The, the remember that when you see any page or any final piece of art, you're not seeing all the years of practice and all the mistakes and failures that, and the, that you have uh, committed along the way. Uh, but for instance, the approach about the gesture drawing, as you can see in that sketch on the left, is actually a journal entry from this monkey is called Sakis in, in the Amazon rainforest. That was in 2012, in July the 14th. Isn't it cool? Like also, when you look at your journals, it really is like, what was I doing on July the 24th of 2012? I was in the Amazon rainforest sketching monkeys in the field. How cool is that? It's a good way to recall these memories. But you can see the sketches in the upper right, that's just your sketches. It's very simple, very quick. It takes a few seconds. If you start losing uh, yourself into the details, you, you are already losing precious seconds. Uh, it's about fast flowing lines, uh, no, nothing hard. And this is something that I would recommend anybody who's learning how to sketch. Uh, you're, the monkeys on the lower left, these are, these are, they're having more detail, they're having more weight and volumes, but the gesture sketch is very, very simple that you can practice. And there you go, you have a second monkey, pretty much in the, the basic proportions. Uh, and as you're sketching, you're making adjustment. And I will show you one, the practical part. I will show you an example how to do sketch, uh, gesture sketching. Again, excellent tool. And if you're interested in learning more about this, there are tons of really good videos in YouTube. All you have to do is just gesture sketching and you will see tutorials and all sort of materials how to polish this skill. So gesture sketching is one. When you're going to draw anything uh it's always worth to look at your subject subject and take a few moments to to think how you're going to sketch this whether it's a plant or an animal or a landscape just take a few moments how you want to observe it this is very valuable before you start putting anything on the paper now that's when you make decisions and you block the basics for blocking the basics there are two approaches and i'm going to talk about both of them right now and the upper left sketch, for instance, shows you, it's a very complex drawing. This drawing is not having reference photos specifically. I have to use multiple, a patchwork of photographs to create this final, the final piece. This was for a coloring book about wolves. Uh, but when you block the volume, you block the basic space that it's gonna take in the page, you have 
two approaches. And the first one that I use a lot more than anything else is about the structure of the subject and the anatomy. And this one requires a little bit of knowledge or practice. Um, like for instance, in this illustration, requires a little bit of understanding of the shape of the crate. I actually had a crate to, to use for, for the sketch and this, the, the three-dimensional structure. The same thing happens with the wolf. If you pay attention to with the wolf and the people, I have had some basic shape uh, shapes show more or less where the rib cage of the wolf would be, the shoulder muscles, the legs, etc. And complementing that with photographs, you know, I, I was just polishing more and more. As you're adding detail, and again, the the structure and anatomy sketch will be look more like the one in the upper left. It's something relatively simple. This has a lot of detail. It's still not. Um, this is a much more advanced one than what I'm trying to convey here, but you can see how the structure will help you to polish the drawing eventually. And this is the fun part of this also. If you go back to the gesture sketching, you're not committed to a final shape yet. Don't get attached. Like, oh, I drew the, the, the head here. Well, actually, the head was a little bit uh, out of place. Uh, don't get attached to it. You can just redraw it again, and you can make adjustments as you go with the gesture sketching. But when it comes to the structure and anatomy, it's important to understand what you're not seeing, what is behind the subject or the perspective or the proportions. Um, when you are starting to do any sketch, it's important, again, take a few moments to plan, to observe, start blocking, and uh, then some gesture sketches to get the basics and revisit the subject and look at the proportions. Uh, it happens all the time. You're like, oh my gosh, the head of this uh, bird turned out to be really big. The beak is not like that. Especially again, when it comes to idea of birds, uh, it's very important the shapes of the beak, for instance. Uh, the same thing with plants and flowers, you know, the enrichment of the structure of the, the branches or the flower and fluorescence uh, can be critical to identify the species if you want to be accurate. But guess what? You don't want to go for the artistic side. Don't worry about this, you know. Uh, this is a little bit so the, the, about this approach, about the structure. And it's more like more about thinking in three dimensional ways, right? The next one is just shapes and shapes is very helpful when we don't fully understand the structure. This is a good example. This is a very difficult position for to draw a wolf because when an animal moves or the angle changes is not conveniently placed sideways. The neck turns and the muscles change shapes, the skin change shapes, and on top of that, the fur change shapes and creates all these volumes that we don't really understand what's going on. Happens a lot with birds. When you look at the skeleton of a bird and you see the actual bird, it's hard to believe that it's the same thing. And they, when they contract their necks or stretch their necks, their body shape changes completely. And that's, this is an incredibly helpful approach. When it comes to shapes, that's when you see often the artists that they close one eye and they use a pencil for proportions. It helps a lot to close one eye because you're not thinking in terms of a three-dimensional structure. You're thinking in terms of a 2D object. You're turning a three-dimensional object. You don't care about the structure that is happening underneath the fur, but it's just simple shapes. And those simple shapes that you can see there, you can be circles, it can be rectangles, it could be polygons, and you connect them. But also this is advanced art skills is when you start using the negative space and the negative space is what is not your subject. The indentations in the shape when you see like the, the wolf, what is the space in between the legs is forming a triangle right here. And here the joint of the wrist look like it's like a circle, you can block it with a circle, but you start breaking into simple shapes. And it's basically you're copying what you're seeing. The beauty of this one, again, it helps uh, when you have a good angle for the photograph that you're trying to copy or the subject is in a very odd position. A good example of that, for instance, is when you're drawing, say, a person. It's very easy if you're drawing me like facing the camera like this. And But if I am a perspective and my head is towards you and my feet are away, it's a little harder to understand what's going on in terms of the anatomy. So this is a good, very helpful, helpful way to start thinking in terms of how to block your shapes all right so all right timing we're good we're good okay we still have about 15 minutes i would like to do a simple uh sharing of some journals and put in a little bit of this concept some of this concept into practice 
Uh, so I'm gonna switch cameras and we tried this earlier and let's hope it works well. Uh huh. Oops, never mind. Let's try it again. Ah, I remembered what it was. There we go. Now you're seeing my desk here and I wanna share with you, for instance, this is a very old journal. This is in Spanish back in the day. You can see the date, 2000, um, March 24, 2000. That is 23 years ago. Uh, again, sometimes some of my journals were very heavy in just notes. This is an example of a postcard, uh, sorry, a stamp, sorry. Uh, sometimes I would try sketches, you know, but sometimes I didn't even have the time. Uh, this was me trying to learn about sharks uh, in Costa Rica back in the day. And because I, at that point, I didn't have access to a good field guide, I created my own one. And this is where the vellum paper was very helpful. I copy all these illustrations of sharks with vellum paper. Uh, then I cut them, glued them to the page, and there you go. Um, again, sometimes uh, I was I was at that point learning some crabs of the Caribbean side. You don't even have to finish the entire crab. You can see very simple, they're very simple drawings, focusing on the color and the shapes of the pinchers or the legs. And that was incredibly helpful. That was a time that I was really into insects and practicing a lot how to, uh, oops, let me see the focus here changed. There we go. Um, just to identify separate different species of butterflies. You didn't even have to draw the entire butterfly and such. Uh, this is a fun one. Again, back in the day, I didn't have the money to buy a field guide uh, about tracks. And I created my own one from a book with vellum paper. You can see this is like 23 years old and still, I still could use this, you know, to identify some of the mammals of Costa Rica in the mud. Uh, it, can, it has taken some beating, which is part of the fun. That's when your journal become very, very personal and such. Um, now, so this is an old journal, very old journal. I have an, a newer version of that one. That's when I start taking notes more in English. Uh, and uh, that's when I moved to the United States in 2005. And I combined it with notes from books, you know, again, fossils. I have a personal interest in paleontology. Some leaf samples, sometimes feathers show up, stuff like that. And uh, this is an example of my more uh, recent style of journal. And these are like my travel journals. You can take again, these journals have been two places. Uh, like in this one, I like to include quotes, stamps. Actually, these are hairs of a peccary. It's a pig-like animal from South America. I got some bristles of an actual individual. I'll get them there. Uh, one of my favorite places to go and do studies is a zoo. You know, reptiles and amphibians don't move, don't move that much sometimes. So they're excellent subjects to sketch. As you can see, this is a combination of gesture, sketch, and volumes of this uh, type of boa. Uh, and again, sometimes I'm more interested in just notes and maps. Ah, I told you about the, one of the beer. <laughs> this is a beer. And again, um, you can be as detailed as you want, you know, and as methodical. In general, I uh, recommend to be consistent, like having location, date. I like to put the time and a little bit of description of, uh, of the weather that can make a difference. These are actually just your sketches of slots. And if you ever heard about slots or are familiar with them, these animals don't move that much. They're extremely easy and fun to draw in the field. Uh, this is a good example of an overwork, overworking a piece. I never was happy with this taper. The taper was just feeding in front of me, but I started adding lines and more lines. And this is a good example of how you can ruin a drawing by overdoing it. So it's good to know when to stop, uh, when it's too much. These are actually in the field of also gesture sketches of this bird called a jacamar that uh, has this habit of flying, catching an insect like the butterfly that Michelle has in her wall right now, uh, whack them against the branch, remove the wings, and eat the nutrition part. But the good thing with the jacamar, like flycatcher, they're predictable. They return to the same perch. So you can have different angles of the same bird. Maps is always a fun thing. It takes more time. But this was a long trip in the outback, and I wanted to record the different places that we were creating. 
So you can use simple techniques and then embellish it with some drawings and some side notes. Uh, I like to do that a lot. Um, and again, sometimes I was not happy with the journal. Oh, this is the one that I just showed you. I wasn't very happy with the journal entry. I was too heavy on the text or I was drawing too much. So finding that sweet balance, you know, between uh, uh, sketches with art and uh, notes, natural history notes. Um, if, if there's always a cultural element. This is in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, they have like these beautiful sidewalks that look like this. I, I thought the pattern was amazing. It's part of the identity and you can use it to decorate it a little bit and give it uh, a bit of a Brazilian flavor. Uh, sketching people, again, is a fun, nice challenge. From time to time, I like to do that. Uh, there you go. Entry ticket. Poems, of course, I, from time to time, or songs. This is a Mayan uh, prey that I found really in a book. I was really moved the way, the, the way the, just the, the sounds of the ancient Maya, the, the Mayan language. And uh, the translation that was just put it there to decoration for the to decorate. And this is a more recent version of my journal. Uh, again, the same thing. I, I like to keep tickets, little memorabilia, notes on plants, little maps. Um, and uh, that's the sketch that I showed you a few moments ago. This is the original one that was in 2017. This is actually an affair in a country fair that they have some raptors, live raptors. And because there's a showing of that, it's an excellent opportunity to sketch. So I'm trying to try landscape. I'm not very patient about landscapes, but I force myself. This is the Old Faithful Geyser in Yellowstone. Uh, you just keep, when you go to museums, I like also art, capture a little bit of indigenous art um, and such. And this is my most recent uh, journal. As you can see, uh, it's interesting to see, to see the progression, how it gets more and more refined. Uh, this was actually sketched live. They have an anesthetized cheetah and the veterinarians were working with it. And so I was just taking, taking sketches with the blue pencil. And this is the part that I wanted to mention. Um, I carry a bunch of uh, pencils uh, with this bl blue leads like this. That's a habit that I acquired when I was uh, in an animation studio. And the beauty of the blue pencil is you can use it to take a very quick sketch. Like this is, the elephant was live. Uh, actually it was a, uh, even a few, I had to finish it a few minutes after we spotted the elephant. I blocked the basic shapes with a blue pencil. You can still see there. And the beauty of the blue pencil, because it's a cold color, it moves to the background. You don't even need to erase it. I just use, uh, I use the, the, the ink on top of it. And the blue kind of disappears or creates a blue glow in the background and it's um it adds something you know and i like it sometimes i use too much blue pencil and i have to start uh, erasing you know i uh, like this scene what it's like almost a more almost an hour in this water hole i was taking different sketches in the notebooks and in this book and i was transferring back and forth and at the end of the day i have tons of uh, all these sketches and uh i just polished them uh like, for instance, again, this is an example of my notebook. Uh, in the moment, I'm trying to do some messy sketches. Uh, who cares? And I might transfer some later or might never transfer them and keep it only in the notebook. This turned out really well at the first attempt. And uh, I left it like that. So again, you have your own ways to uh, take your notes. And it's part of the fun of it. All right. So I would like to do a quick practice here and show you I have some paper and i have a beetle that is not the actual size this is a replica model but it's cool because it's articulated it's very helpful to to teach about insects uh but it's actually like the actual beetle is like two-thirds of the actual size of this this is a stag giraffe beetle but it could be very helpful again to show some of the things that i was telling you like for instance again if i will be taking a field no, uh, a journal note about this beetle you can try it yourself i will just block an area right there the date uh the location the name of the subject if i happen to know if i don't know yeah it's a good opportunity to write uh you know to to 
write questions or notes. Where do I, did I find is this insect? Let's pretend. And then I'm going to do a quick gesture sketch of this beetle. Um, as you can see, it's very quick. It takes only a few seconds. And it helps to know a little bit the body parts of an insect, you know, the anatomy that has thorax, abdomen, and that's blocking the legs. And I have my base. It took only a few seconds, right? Um, if I'm doing a sketch, uh, again, assuming that you have the beetle or that insect is very helpful because obviously it will not move. But sometimes, again, you can have it in your hand moving, and that's when you have to learn how to squick, uh, uh, do sketches very fast. Now I'm going to do like a quick blocking of the different shapes as you can see again i'm going for the gesture not a lot of details i can take a photograph of the beetle later and try to finish later in camp let's say but you can see they have like the basic shapes of the animal the antenna and now here has some unique this is the fun part with insects, you know, the, the problem is because obviously they're small and we cannot fully appreciate, they have all these weird shapes, you know, that when you pay attention, it's not as simple as just a ball. And again, I'm going to more put in more details that block the basic here. That's the gesture sketch of the body of the beetle, right? And it took only a few seconds, as you can see. Now, don't feel discouraged. I've been doing this for many years. Um, one question that I, I, I heard a lot and I like a lot is, when was the last time you actually took the time to do a drawing? If it was years ago, say when you were a teenager, you're still drawing as a teenager. And that is uh, an invitation to just keep practicing. Even professional artists will tell you, you know, after a few moments, uh, I'm sorry, a few months or a few weeks of not drawing, you feel how your hand start feeling stiff. You, their muscles coordination uh, being eye and fingers is not the same now here of course you have a very quick uh, sketch of the legs that's all that you need there and same thing here with the basic pieces there that look like little rectangles when you again when your sketch is why is it important to do uh, uh gesture sketches you capture subconsciously a lot of things that you will not get from a photograph and that's the beauty of that once you have this in your journal ah, take a picture of the beetle try to finish it later if i want to but in theory you can totally live like that as simple as it is um now, for this one, I was using a combination of what I told you. I was thinking in terms of negative spaces. When I think about negative spaces, I was just in my mind thinking, oh my goodness, there is a triangle right here. You can see oh, this triangle here, right? And this is an oval area here. And you can see like a, like a trapezoid shape here. So you're blocking away what is not your subject. Now, Let's say I want to work it even more, right? I have, again, one of the cool things is to really understand the three dimensionality of an animal or a plant. And in terms of evolution, think about this too. Like the simple, the simple fact that these uh, jaws have these particular angles might change the, the, the pressure force in certain areas. So that's an important thing if you want to keep it accurate, right? So, but here in the head, and seeing some of the shapes, you can do a very quick blocking like this. The light is coming mostly from my left, from this direction. And again, it's not a flat subject. And it projects a shadow on its own body. And there you go. You have a little bit more three-dimensionality on your beetle. And of course, if you want to get, get more more detail is up to you again you, you choose where to stop the gesture sketch is fun it's playful it doesn't have to be super accurate again you polish it later if you want to work in a scientific illustration but just leave it like that it has a lot of personality oh of course you want you want to think it has a shadow and that's a tricky part sometimes if you don't get it right you must start looking odd but you can start adding that then you can add bolder lines to emphasize weight. Thicker lines add volume. Uh, if you have a subject, uh, you know, 
with a shadow, uh, with a, uh, sorry, an illuminated part and a part in the sheet, you can add more of uh, this. And it doesn't have to be uniform. This is one of the things. Symmetry is boring. Uh, any artist can tell you that. So you can just play around. When it comes to gesture sketching too, um, Joe Muir Laws have a funny, uh, fun exercise in one of his books, and I'm going to show it to you. Think about this. If you have pen and paper, try drawing a circle. Okay, do the best you can. Okay, that's not terribly bad. When you are doing gesture sketch, you can make choices along the way. Look what I'm doing. I'm grabbing my, pen, my pen, pencil in a very loose way. You cut and add pieces more and more. Notice I'm starting with very soft lines and increasingly I can just add some more details. That's a little bit more polished and is more uh, interesting. All these lines, you know, that these gesture lines, change of the position of the paper helps. And you can do the same thing even with ink. It's not the same if I'm drawing a circle, for instance, like this. If I start like keeping the pencil above the paper, it's hovering sometimes. This is more interesting and less boring than that. Again, this is one approach. Now, uh, I'm gonna show you something quickly here. We still have a, maybe a minute or two. When a good approach for the uh, shapes or, or structures, if you really know the anatomy of this, this is a replica uh, of a saber tooth tiger, a smilodon. Uh, if you really understand the anatomy, Good for you. You know, you can work it that way. Skulls are a pain in the rear end to sketch. So it's good to, do, to focus on shapes. So this, when I'm trying to do, create the basic for a sketch like this, I'm going to do something very quick to so have time for question Q and A. Is I close, I'm literally closing one eye in what I'm seeing here. And again, the perspective that you will see in, in the camera is probably slightly different to what I have. But I basically see geometric shape like this and this and then i start embellishing it with the teeth the angles of the super orbital here the fenestras and the sagittal crest and then then i have a base you know there's also contour sketching um we don't have the time to talk about it today but you can start with something like this and then start adding all the details you know, the three dimensionality and there's a, like more teeth in the back here, you can start adding shade and start building your volumes little by little. But again, I started soft, so I have the opportunity to work it hard um, as I go along and create more bolder lines, you know, instead. So I would remember to try and sketch gentle at first. It takes practice to train your hand. There are different ways to grab your pencil. It could be like this, could be like this. But don't, don't, don't start sketching like this because that is harder to erase. That's a good advice for any person who would like to get there, uh, get uh, started in art. Anyway, uh, I think that was uh, a little bit of uh, everything that I wanted to cover. Again, it's just um, not enough time. There's so much to explain about what is how to keep different styles of nature journals, but hopefully you find something helpful. Maybe we can go to some questions. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm sure we're all itching to go outside and do some sketchings and try out some of the tips that you had. Um, I would love to open it up to the audience's questions before I ask my questions. And you feel free to unmute yourself and say something. It doesn't have to be a question, or you can put your questions in the chat. Maybe to start with a quick question, um, how much time do you then typically spend doing the details? Because I know when I draw, I keep on doing the details and then I screw it up and then <laughs> that sucks. So how much time is it? does it depend or what do you usually do? Good question. Thank you, Annelien. And Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name uh, properly. No, it's fine. up to you. <laughs> well, it's up to you. That's the, the, the short answer is 
uh, a very elaborate sketch can be up to 40 minutes. You know, that's when you add a lot of lines and details. But that's what, what every, uh, every experienced artist will tell you. Check with yourself and you will realize when you're reaching that point that there's a lot of lines, what direction am I going? You just keep doing lines. Stop. Take a moment. Stop. Think for a moment. What's not working here? If it's not working, just stop there. Leave it there. It was good enough before. Yeah, I cannot fix it. It's fine. I actually use uh, uh, white out sometimes in my journals too because like that was a really cool sketch and I ruined it. So knowing where to stop is one is an art. It takes time. It gets to know your own level of skills and, and also where do you want to go and what direction you want to take it. I, is it enough a, a gesture sketch? Sometimes it is all that I need because like for instance the illustration that I show you the, uh, in the journal entry with the rent. I have the material, those sketches turn out really well. I can use that one day to do a full illustration in Photoshop or I paint, paint in acrylic or a final one. The gesture is there, I have the positions. So it's up to you. I, I would say simple is better often. And I remind that to myself because I sometimes I overwork a lot. And uh, I like to try different styles of lines too. Uh, I, I like to start with some simple sketches and then have a piece that it has a little bit more volume, more detail, like, oh, this is really good, and combine that with some more simple stuff and text. And again, it's up to you. It can take, again, five minutes. It can take 20 minutes. And once you get really good at uh, knowing your style and training your hand, you know, in, in, in half an hour, you can have a really nice illustration. Chris, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I'm sure. going to move quickly so we can answer them all. One of them is, what kind of journal do you recommend? Are there different purposes? So for example, there's lined journals, there's plain, there's dotted. Do you, do you see uses for each version for different applications? And which ones do you recommend? Excellent question. I am a huge fan, and not because I'm getting paid anything for the company, the Moleskins. Uh, they have sturdy covers. The pages, uh, they have these small skins that are for art, that the pages are relatively thick, and I like that. Uh, the ones with thinner pages are fabulous too. I actually took some notes in one of these, for instance, but you can see through the pages. The, what is in the back, it kind of annoys, it annoys me. Um, I have tried this right in rain, waterproof engineers grade into. These are fantastic in the field. It has lines. I'm not a huge fan of lines anymore. Uh, I try to, to write as straight as I can. And one of the tricks that I use, I keep a postcard in my journals. And uh, when I start the first line, I, I put the postcard to level my, my, my first line of writing. And then I just keep doing manually. So that helps. Uh, but it varies. The little moleskins like this, also, these are like the type of pocket ones. Let me show you something. These are some of the old ones. I'm not joking. And some of them have dates like 2019, sorry, 2015. And uh, I use different uh, thickness. This was from a pocket from 2000, pocket notes from 2012 and 2015. I like the fact that you can pack a lot in one, but it's a little rigid to keep it in the back of your pants. Uh, so I, I went, I started using thinner ones since then. Uh, some people use the type that are like, I don't have any here to show you. Oh, they're, they're thinner, but I don't have any here. Uh, it varies. Art books yeah. in general, it's your choice. What are the other questions? Art? So another question came up a couple of times um, is that which pencil did you use in the last section of your sketch demo? What, what's, what's that pencil? This pen here that I use is uh, actually was a gift from my boss in the animation studio in 2003, 2002. This is like 20 years old. The brand is Lamy. Uh, it's like a three, the, the problem with this pencil is finding the leads is very difficult because they're like 3.1, it's a very odd number. I like it a lot because it's thick and heavy and you can change the, the shape um, all the time. When it comes to mechanical pencils, I use 0 0.7. 0 0.5 is too fragile for me, it breaks all the time. 0.9 to be, could be too thick for miniature sketches and details. So 0.7 is one thing that I use. It's just a regular lead pencil. And I buy this blue lead 0.7 online on Amazon. Good question. Great. And then one more question is, how has your sketching changed 
with biomimicry. And the question is, did you try adding the eyesight to your sketching practice? Yes, uh, the same thing. One of my favorite ones are the sound maps. Uh, we uh, practice with several immersions of the B pros. Uh, it changes because I started asking more questions with my mimicry, the practice of biomimicry, not just like recording. I saw this species, you know, yada yada yada. It's also like, what is this? What? Why these particular leaves changing uh, in this, uh, certain portions of the plant? What are what the pubescence in this particular one is are are shorter? Uh, so that's when I. I, and, and allow myself to be, uh, how can I say, the more creative in my questioning. Yeah. And that's one of the fun part, the functions. And it's just, you're not just recording, oh, that's a not shaped leaf. Well, what is it for? Why is it particularly yeah. thick? You know, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, those new questions. Um, we're going to do fire drill style questions. So how often do you go out and sketch while you have a full-time job? That's a good question. Uh, in my regular life, not as much as I would like to. Uh, I do go out and sketch maybe once a week if I'm really active. So when I'm very busy, I'm not. When I'm traveling, I sketch daily almost, which is a different thing. When I go on an, in a nature hike, so it varies. Nice. nice. And then somebody said, do you, when you go outside, do you find yourself carrying around a lot of field guides and books to help you identify things? Or do you have a routine of sitting down with a guide after you've captured something? Both. Yes. And yes. And uh, yes. usually the one that I carry all the time in my bird guide, because I'm a habit bird watcher, my binoculars bird guide, that's the one that I always need to carry. Anything else an extra depending on my backpack and my mood and how long the hike is. So, yeah. Um, Along with that, what kind of gear is the absolute minimum for you to bring on a trip? Uh, pocket, pocket notebook, a pencil, a couple of ink, uh, like these are waterproof, which I like a lot, the Stadler ones, and uh, my, my journal, binoculars, bird guide, that's all that I need, you know. Uh, sometimes I don't even bring my nice journal, I'll leave it behind, but you have the notebook, I can take as many notes and, you know, get it wet and tear the pages and I don't care. But the nice journals, so sometimes it's like, you can't tell you, you get a little bit attached to them. You want it to be in good shape. Yes, yes. And then they be, they get, they fill up a whole bit bookshelf over time behind you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. I think that's all of the questions that we have. I did want to thank Venetia, who is in the background running the technology for this webinar. Um, thank you, Venetia, for making sure everything goes smooth. And thank you, Chris, for your inspiring talk for sharing your amazing skills with us and to giving us a little bit of an insight into what your process is and your approach. Um, it's been very inspiring for me. I know I want to get back into it more. Sometimes the drawing goes out the wayside because we get busy, but it's nice to get the reminder. For um, Switzerland, by Remigri Switzerland, we scheduled it at this time because at this time, the weather gets better in Switzerland and we want people to get outside after the winter time and connect with nature and connect with yourself, get some meditative moments and start drawing a little bit. Um, also, <laughs> yeah, go then, out. Yeah, you have to go out and connect. And that's when you actually gather all the knowledge through, through not the brain, right? I mean, we can read and we can learn data and we can memorize diagrams, but when we sketch, there is some connection between the hand and the brain that brings out those other questions and that help us remember. Um, so yeah, it's there's a magic to the, the drawing of the impact it has on our biomimetic understanding of nature and connection we have to nature. So thank you very much, Chris, for your time. Thank you everybody for coming. Venetia shared a lot of links on the in the chat if you wanna join us. Also, Spymaker Switzerland offers these webinars for free. It's all volunteer based. We would love it if you like these webinars that first of all, you join us again and you sign up for the newsletter, but also for you to, if you have the means to maybe support financially, um, the link is given in the chat. And so also, if you wanna join the Biomimicry Switzerland group, we have people from California, we have people from all over Europe and South Africa. So if you're interested in supporting the organization, then we would love to have you join us. We have monthly meetings and we have lots of fun. We're working on a special card set right now that is based in the Alpine organisms. And so, yeah, we got some really fun things happening. 
Um, and yeah, I'll stay online until everybody has left so that if there's any questions by anyone, I'll be happy to collect more questions and I'll be happy to share them with Chris as well. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for coming and thank you, Chris, for your time. And thanks, Venetia, for your support. Thank you. Thank you all everybody for joining thank me. And you. again, if you have any questions or want to expand on something, feel free to contact me. Michelle has all the links in that were there in the slides too, in my Instagram too, where I put journal entries from time to time. Yeah, follow on Instagram for sure.